Hello, hello. Hey, what's going on? Cruise, nothing much, man. Just uh, having my emails blowing up and just staying busy. It's good, man. It's good. How's work been? It's work, man. <laughs> it's been work. When you, when, you, what's when, that? You, when you do that, do you get like pretty sweaty? Because I would assume like I feel like you'd get pretty hot doing that type of labor. Um, when we're grinding, yeah, bro. When we're grinding the floors, yes, heck yeah. But uh, like when I'm cutting and stuff, like if it's nonstop, where I have to like, because in the summertime it gets pretty hot. That's when I I can sweat a little bit, but no, we can't have sweat on the floor at all. Oh, really? Yeah, you can't. You can't have any moisture at all. I didn't know that. Yeah. What's up, Cruz? How are you doing, man? Hey, what's up, man? How you doing? I'm doing all right. Cool, cool. Doing good. Thanks. Hi, everyone, as well. <laughs> hello, hello. Awesome. We'll let some more people join up here. Give it a few more minutes. Paul, it's good to see you. I haven't seen your name recently. Sandra, of course, always glad to see you join us. Let me try to find this call recording here. Hello, Laura. Give it just a couple more minutes and then we'll go ahead. I was gonna eat something, but I think I'm 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 gonna wait. I'll be right back. No worries, no worries. What's new? Anything new with you, Cruz, or anyone else? You're the only one that has your cam on right now. Uh none really. Uh just work, man. It's literally it. Nice. You've been pretty busy with that lately. Yeah, man. Really. It's good. I mean, it's a blessing, but man, I just, <laughs> not much time for anything else, honestly. Yeah, I feel you. Yeah. What about you guys? Um, Good, man. Just just staying busy. Um, Managing those those houses in Lubbock is, has been fun. I think we're kind of over that hiccup we had the last couple of weeks with the pipes bursting and all that and getting a couple of them listed Um, and locking up some of these cash deals now and doing that kind of thing, so. Yeah, it's good. good. Just busy. What'd Heck you get? What'd you get to eat, Alex? No, I was gonna eat ice cream, but I was like, "No, nah, I'm not about to eat." <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Uh, are we st are we still text blasting, Alex, for before Zooms or now, or is it just Discord? Yeah, yeah. I, oh, okay, I got you. I was um, wondering if you stopped right. using. I would. I would replug it. Sounds That's really bad. Is that better? Yeah, that was better. Okay, cool, cool. All right. We're going to go over just some some basic sales training stuff. We're going to touch a little more today on, on the direct-to-seller stuff. Um, I have a call that I wanted to share, kind of the whole sales process of, of how we're treating these calls with direct-to-seller. Um, these aren't really direct-to-agent. Today, we're not going to be covering really direct-to-agent stuff. This will be more so of the sales process on direct-to-seller leads. So... I'll share a call on that in a in a little bit here. Um, before before we kind of dive into that and break down that call and how we present that, um, any questions or feedback from anyone so far, kind of on the week or since the weekend, any leads you've looked at, any questions you have, or anyone potentially have any calls that they may want to share. That's kind of what we do on Tuesdays mainly, just Q and A, go over people's call recordings and. Things like that. Just want to see if anyone has any uh, any calls they want us to review. Yeah, and then Chandler. I know Chandler's been killing it. Uh, we locked up a deal last week that looks really, really good. So excited to work on that one with him. Um, but yeah, Chandler, any any problems or anything you're kind of running into over the past week? Because I know you've been kind of putting in those calls, and so I'm sure you got some some type of feedback. It's okay. Maybe he's not here. Um, 
No worries. Cool. I'm trying to find that uh I'm trying to remember the name of that lead. I'm about to pull it up here for that uh that call that that I wanted to share. Okay, so I got that one ready. I'd definitely like to open the floor though first before we play that because it is it is kind of a, a longer call. We don't have to play the whole thing, of course. We can kind of just skip around on it. But um uh, definitely want to see if anyone has anything they want to share though first or any questions before we before we play that recording. Um, should we jump right into the recording, Alex, or is there anything we wanted to touch on before that? Let's hop in. I think this call was one of Jack's better call, better one of Jack's better calls, and I think uh, I learned from it, so I'm sure it'll be helpful. Let me uh, give you host, Jack. Or can, do you mind playing it, Alex? Yeah. I'm. I'm like my screen share with the audio was kind of embarrassing last time, so. <laughs> Um, if you have it downloaded, what's up, Chandler? Oh, hey, man, my bad. I came in like right at the last bit of when you were speaking. I was helping my chick with something. You're good, man. I knew you were there, just probably doing something. Yeah. So the reason I uh mentioned you, I just was bringing up our recent deal, and I was curious if you've kind of been running to any challenges concerns over the past week starting to look at a little bit more of these cash deals i'm not sure what you were doing prior to us connecting but um seems like you're on the right path you're making calls you're sending offers and so yeah man i mean i mean the only problems that i guess i'm running into is just that i'm so new to the game everything's still so new to me um I really, what I was doing before this, I was actually a, a fiber optic technician and I moved out of state. It's kind of a crazy story, but I moved out of state and, and I got laid off because my company backed out and I just started grinding and putting everything I had into this. And it's just been, it's just been kind of going good, I guess. Yeah. I'm sorry to hear that, but it uh, sounds like you're on the right path, man. You're, you're doing it a lot faster than someone like me. So just keep it up. Um, focus on making offers like that should be like your biggest thing you're tracking yeah that's that's all i do all, all day for like probably 12 hours a day <laughs> awesome man yeah nice uh we need to get you a dialer man so this could be a little bit more efficient because yeah you're killing it keep it up just wanted to kind of highlight you because I, well, I appreciate I, it man thank you yeah cool um let's jump into this call because yeah like i said it was and one thing to just mention too with uh with the structure on these calls like i used a similar framework um before alex and i really jumped into the sub two creative finance deals for for cold calling direct to seller or i should say closing direct to seller leads um similar structure and that's where we kind of got this one from and then alex and i kind of tweaked it a bit but it's super important for direct to seller leads or even direct to agent leads, of course, just having a solid script and framework you're following, but especially with direct to seller, because there's a lot of pillars there and a lot of ways you can go with the deal. So as I've said a lot, you know, your cash, your cash offers typically like the low ball anchor. And I think on this call, this guy, we weren't too far off cash wise. It could work cash wise. Um, and then novation wise, he was open to the idea of the novation. It, uh, it could work as a novation as well too. And um, I think that's the route we're going to go with it would, would be to do an ovation. Um, we're just kind of scheduling things with him and, and getting everything set up for, for pictures and a walkthrough because there is some damage to the property. But um, we definitely follow a framework of, of setting the stage, pre-qualifying pre that lead, setting the stage, which is basically breaking down the rules, saying who we are, seeing if they're available for time, if they're the main decision maker. And then we're pivoting into the the kind of the low ball anchor of, Hey, investors are paying for properties like this in your area here and here cash wise. And, uh, you're never going to follow the exact same script and, and structure as you would every single call. It's ideal. It's there for a framework, but like this guy was kind of a savvy investor. And I think I asked him, I'm like, Hey, what do you think, you know, this house all fixed up would be worth. And he pretty told me exactly like right on the money. So, um, also motivated and whatnot, but just wanted to kind of chime in on a few of those things before we we actually listen to the call 
and uh, we can kind of jump around and, and not listen to the whole call because, like I said, it is a little longer. But uh, if it just seems to drag on a bit, Alex, you could skip <laughs> a couple minutes forward. Yeah. All righty, let me start it up. Hey, Troy, this is Jack, the home buyer. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Doing well, thank you. You spoke with one of my employees yesterday about uh, your property, 1716 of Ella Road. Yeah. Yeah, just wanted to speak to you a bit today about that property. Now a good time to speak. Do you have maybe 10 minutes or so for me? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So I'm the home buying specialist here on our team. I'm the one that just meets with sellers. My job is really just to figure out which houses we're going to buy and to really just work out the price in terms with each seller I meet with. So would it be okay if I just take a couple minutes here to kind of lay the groundwork of how these calls typically go? Okay, great. I'm going to pause it where I think everyone should be focusing their attention just so we all could kind of catch it collectively. And so this is like a closing call. Like this wasn't the first call. So it's a little different, although you could do expectation setting in your first cold call, but this is a closing call. And um, it really just sets the stage. It makes the tone for the conversation. Um, it really sets us as the buyer in control of the conversation, which is really, really important. So the process is pretty simple here. Like I said, I'll just confirm some basic information with you, crunch some numbers, and give you a, a couple different options here. And if there's one option that really works for you and you really like it, I can totally write that up, but if for some reason none of the options work for you, that's completely okay too. Just so you know, when it works out, that's great. If it doesn't, at least we gave it our best shot. So really no pressure at all whatsoever for you. Does that sound good? Yeah. Okay, great. And I am wondering too then, Troy, if we were to, if we were interested in one of these options and it was something you wanted to move forward with, would there be anyone else involved that might be even just a tiny bit upset if you didn't let them know what you were doing first? Are you the main decision maker here? This is your house. No one else owns it with you. Well, my wife owns it with me, but she, I have power of attorney alert. She had three strokes, so she would have really upset at this point. Sorry to hear that. And so when he mentions that his wife is sick, um, you hear how Jack instantly drops like his tone of voice. Like there's a huge, huge jump from the his last words to when he says, I'm sorry to hear that. So um, that's just sm the small things that I think are really important to like highlight because it just builds rapport. Um, and it just, it seems like you're listening to what they're saying when you do that. Um. Okay. So the reason the reason I asked that is just because, you know, of course, selling a house is a big decision. And at the end of this call, you know, I always like to just ask for a solid yes or no as to whether or not you are ready to potentially sell the property to us. Like I said, either answer is totally fine. But the last thing I want to do is come to some sort of agreement that you and I have. And then all of a sudden, you know, there's other people, a bunch of other people involved. Well, oh, this, that, this. And then, you know, it just doesn't work out for us. Uh, so just make sure there's no misunderstandings too. We are not a retail buyer. We're a real estate investment company. So we do work with a large group of investors. We buy properties in as is condition and we usually pay all cash for it. And can close on your time friend. So dealing with someone like us, there's not gonna be any hidden fees, real estate commissions, 100 closing costs, you don't have to worry about that. So that being said, you know, an investment company we do need to make a little bit of a profit, of course, on every house we buy. Otherwise, I'm sure we wouldn't really be a company <laughs> and we wouldn't be doing this. We wouldn't be very good investors. So for a lot of people, though, we are still people's preferred choices than selling traditionally, such as working with a real estate agent. Um, I'm curious, do you have any do you have any questions regarding that so far? Well, okay. Okay, yeah, so usually when I meet with people, just they just want to know a few things typically one of those is which what happens next if we decide to work together how much are we willing to pay when would we be able to actually close the sale so was there anything else you were you were hoping to kind of discover or know on this call other than those three main things right there not at all okay 
And naturally, of course, to see if this is actually a good fit for us. I know you spoke with one of my employees yesterday, so some of this may sound familiar to you. Um, so apologies if I'm asking some of the same questions. This will just be very quick, though. Um, I'm wondering, in terms of the property and the condition, just to brief. Alex, can you pause real quick? On that. Before I continue talking, does my mic sound F to anyone else? Yes. It sounds really bad. Oh, my gosh, man. Um. Okay, well, I'll have to get this wire fixed, so I'll do that later today. But um, setting the stage, like, that that was the end of setting the stage right there. Like, laid down the ground rules, made sure the seller's available to speak, they have time, and basically said, like, hey, let's let's have this conversation. This won't just be, like, a little two-minute thing. Um, I want to know if you really want to sell your house and look we'll over all the options. So we laid the stage, and then now we're just diving quickly back into what the condition is like with the property. Um, it's in livable condition. It was rented out previously, but it's been vacant for the last four to five years. Um, the roof does need work, but pretty much besides that, would you say new paint, maybe flooring, or is it literally just the only thing you know of is the roof needs work? Well, I mean, there's some interior work that needs to be done. Um, I started to, uh, remodel which is the property. So, um, when I started, of course, I went ahead and finished. During my wife's situation, I just haven't been able to get back out to it. Gotcha. Probably was rented prior to that. Um, it had been rented for many years prior to me not being able to get back out there. But at this point, you know, yeah, the roof does need addressed. Uh, interior wise, the bathroom is probably going to need addressed because that's where the roof was leaking at in the bathroom. Um, so that'll need to be addressed. Um, back side of the, uh, right there off the bathroom. Yeah, a little bit out. Uh, Maybe like two minutes or a minute. Just, gotta just get locked it. up. Um, Let me know when to stop. You could go, I mean, it is accessible as far as you go up to the front porch, go through the windows. And yeah. You can kind of see what you're dealing with. More? Yeah, maybe to like eight minutes or something. So a lot of it's just him going through. And it's kind of out of my way, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. I mean, if it wasn't for her situation like that, but I really like it. Sure. Okay. And, um, okay, I appreciate the info there. And in terms of you want to sell this, it, dude, you know what it is? We're in a Discord call still. That's what it is. Well, I mean, I know, like you said, with, with your with your wife's health and, and managing that and not having time to really go back to your projects you were working on, is that kind of the main reason why you're you're interested in, in selling this property? Or yeah. yeah, and it's kind of out of my way, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. I mean, if it wasn't for her situation, of course, I, I would keep the house. I would fix the house and uh, turn around and buy, rent it out or sell the house. So either way, um, you know, I have multiple, multiple properties, so... Sorry, can you pause real quick? Crawling under my desk, unplugging things, and I was in the Discord call. That's funny. Um, one thing to mention there with, with motivation and everything, his wife's really sick. He has power of attorney over his wife to make any sort of legal decisions with the properties. And um, this this house isn't too local to him. It's like an hour drive. So you can imagine if his wife is this sick and he's not hurting financially, um this property's just sitting there vacant. That's probably the last thing on his mind right now, just to deal with this property. So essentially, he's not going to give it away for free, but he is motivated. It's just sitting there, and he doesn't see in the foreseeable future him working on this project at all, basically. So that's just another thing I, I want to mention, too. Like this, this is kind of the ideal example of a motivated seller. Um, and uh, yeah, I just wanted to skip maybe like four minutes or so of the call because a lot of that was just us going over condition and just basic things like that. Do you want to play again, Alex? Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Definitely, if it wasn't for her situation, I would keep this. And have you ever thought about potentially even going, you know, the traditional route, fixing it up and listing with an agent? Or, of course, the reason you haven't listed with an agent is because you don't want to have to fix it all up and go through that process. Is that right? Yeah, I definitely don't want to deal with an agent. Um, I mean, I can sell a property myself without an agent. Yeah, uh, clearly. Very, 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 very long enough to know what to do. 
Yeah. The experience of dealing with agents. There's no sense in me paying somebody else money when I can keep that money in my pocket. Yeah. So it makes a, makes a lot of sense. A lot of people don't realize the agent commission, the holding costs with that, a lot of the renegotiations that come back with inspection reports and repairs and, and all that stuff to closing costs, it definitely adds up. Um, and say if you did sell it traditionally with like an agent, of course. Sorry, can you pause it? So it's harder to sell. I just want to really break this call down and add a lot of feedback and stuff because um, it's it's helpful. But um, like when I started doing this stuff a year and a half ago, it was very it was very survey like like I don't want to say this, I don't want to say that. What if it makes the sellers think this? But like literally me saying, "Have you thought about listing it with an agent?" Like me saying that, if you're, I'm sure a lot of people listening to that are thinking, "Why would you say? Have you thought about listing it with an agent? Because couldn't they just go reach out to an agent now and try to sell it that way?" Well, that is a, a, you know, there is a probability of that, but honestly, before they end up making a decision, real estate agents are usually everyone's go-to. So right there, I'm pretty much disqualifying the agent route and helping him realize that. And he pretty much already disqualified it. Like he said, I don't want to deal with listing this thing with a real estate agent. And then I said, yeah, of course, like closing costs, holding costs, the renegotiations that always happen, you know, it always adds up. It's, it's not worth going that route. And he agreed. So pretty much I brought up a potential objection, heard the seller's reasoning, and then agreed and disqualified it with the seller why that wouldn't work. Um, yeah, so just wanted to mention that. Cool. Well, things add the condition on the MLS, of course, but I mean, considering us, you not having to pay realtor commissions with us, we're covering all closing costs, we're buying as is, we're dealing with all repairs, everything like that. What would kind of be that, that, bottom dollar for you all cash that would make you happy to, you know, sell the property for? Well, like I told your guy yesterday, 60. Um, I mean, the property sat, I mean, the property, uh, the property was valued at uh, 50000 over 10 years ago. Okay. Sure, um, you know, properties aren't like cars, so, you know, they don't depreciate like the car does. Um, anything that value increases, um, consider things that you do, and then um, just sometimes just being uh, a national comp. Um, those as comps to figure out prices on the house that is actually being sold. So, yeah, if it's something that's comparable, you know, it, it's, it still holds its value. Um, yep. so that's kind of where I'm at with it. Okay, gotcha. And I mean, what would you say are kind of most important to you? Because as investors, there's there's a handful of things we can offer sellers in your situation. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of different options. We the way we buy properties, we buy all cash. We have a couple of different programs as well. Um, you know, I, I wish I could give everyone everything, all the cake, but of course I got to eat a little bit too. So I'm wondering, like, what's most important to you? Is it speed, convenience, speed and price, price, convenience? Kind of what's what's the most important thing? To you out of that and one thing alex if you don't mind pausing it be, uh... i'm just trying to break down the whole sales process that we're kind of using for direct to seller leads um so what i'm doing there is what's most important to you speed speed convenience price like kind of breaking that down and really i'm seeing a lot of the times with these kind of leads, you're usually going to end up disqualifying the cash offer because the cash offer usually works a very small percentage of the time because the cash offer is like a liquidation sale. Like, hey, you're fed up with this house. You're sick of it. You need money now. Okay, I'm going to give you 60% of what the house is worth, right? So most people won't sell their house for 60% of what it, it could actually be worth. Some people do, don't get me wrong for sure, but a lot of the times, 99% of the time, that won't be the case. So what I'm kind of doing there is by saying, well, mentioning the cash offer and how we have some other options, I'm kind of pre-framing the seller for a disqualification of the cash offer of it being too low. And then I'm also kind of planting the seed of, hey, we have some different options as well too. And pretty soon after this, he will say what's kind of important to him. And it kind of sets the stage for an ovation where we kind of team up together and we do an ovation and basically I list the property for him and offer to do repairs and, and get a higher price than what he would get with a traditional cash sale. Um, but I kind of like gave him a ballpark range of 
he might be anywhere from, I think he would take maybe 50 to 55,000 cash when he originally said 60, but then on an ovation, I kind of told him like, Hey, I could give you 60 if we did an ovation and, uh, you know, he would net more at closing, but like I asked, what's most important to you? If he said speed, then novation probably isn't the move for him because innovation, you know, 60 days, 90 days, we're listing this property on the market. Um, cash sale, boom, it could be three weeks. So that's that's why you mentioned that there. And you it, it allows you to pre-frame and also get a better understanding of what's most important to the seller for which offer would be best to to try to present to them with the most kind of force. Because if I, if I see in notes from someone that, hey, here's this lead, they're asking $50,000 over market value, or let's say not quite that much, but let's say they're asking slightly over market value. They're super firm on that. I won't even waste my time through all the mumbo jumbo of, of what you heard on this call for 15 minutes. And I'll kind of just go into, I'll chop it up a little quicker and go right into the, hey, here's a terms offer. I can get you the price you want and basically explain seller financing. And a lot of the times tired landlords, they'll bite on that kind of offer because um, you can give them the price they want. But um, it's still important though to have that cash offer and that range always kind of there as an anchor to justify why these other options could be better. But uh, yeah, if you want to click play, Alex, thanks. Yeah. Because you're fine with that, mm -hmm. you know, sitting there vacant for another year or so. It's not hurting you right now or anything, right? right. Yeah. Right. I mean, I'm still paying for it. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah. it doesn't make me a never mind. You know what I mean? At this point, totally. um, other than the fact that and I may have to do a little extra work than, than I had to do previously. You know what I mean? Like, so, yeah. Um, I mean, I do do the work. I can do the work. I just. Jack, should I skip a couple minutes here? Yeah, I would skip, like, skip two minutes and see where, where we're at. Five. I mean, you know, it might be something. I mean, I'm not going to quiver. Yeah, so we were kind of factoring potentially a new roof and things like that. Uh, but pretty much what investors have been paying kind of in that area recently for properties similar in size. Like I said, we don't know the exact interior condition, though. But from that square footage, we're looking roughly at like forty to 55000 in terms of like what we would get approval on for a cash offer. Uh, of course, though, that's just a ballpark. And we haven't seen Can you pause that? So that's what I always say too. Like at start of calls, I'll say you spoke with one of my employees previously, even if that person spoke with Alex, Alex isn't my employee, <laughs> you know, we're partners, whoever, right? Like we'll just refer to at the start of a call. It gives a sense of authority. If you say like, Oh, you spoke with my employee or someone like that. So that, that seller is going to know, Oh, I'm speaking with someone maybe more legit or whatnot. Right. So like, that's, that's something that I was always trained on saying like, Oh, you spoke with my employee previously. And then they figure you're the main decision maker or one of the upper decision makers when it comes to numbers and, and money and what you can actually offer that seller. Um, and another thing too, so you want to have some sense of authority, but you also don't want to be the absolute top dog. Cause in this call, I say like, I'm the, I'm the acquisition specialist here. I'm one of the managers. I got approval here. So like, I'm not saying, Hey, this is our concrete for sure offer. This is where investors are buying like properties like yours. They're buying in this range. And I made sure I pitched the range below what he wanted. Cause honestly, it probably works cash wise. It's probably a little tight at his ask price, but if we locked it up cash at 50 K, I think it's a deal. But, um, I told him investors are paying, you know, 40 to 55,000 for properties like yours in that area, same square footage. How does that sound to you? And Basically, he was saying, I'm firm at 60K. And now he's like, you know, if we were if we were closer to, to you know, 50, that upper range, I think we could do something there. So now I've kind of anchored him and know he'll probably take 50K cash. And then if he wants 60, now I have an innovation opportunity there um, as well. So just wanted to chime in and mention that quick. If you want to press play again, Alex. Yet or anything like that. Um, I don't know if, if that's something that range kind of works for you. I'm guessing probably not. Well, I mean, the 55 is closer to the 50, you know, I mean, 40 to 55, I mean, that's a, that's a nice range. Um, but as long yeah. as we stay on the high range of it, you know, the 55, I mean, that yeah, might be something. I mean, I'm not going to quiver over $5,000, you know, yeah. for $55,000. You know, yeah. I'm not, just not going to do it. I would, of course, accept that offer if it was, if that's what it was. But if it's not that, then I probably wouldn't accept it. 
Yeah, totally understand. Um, yeah, so I mean, we're close. We're close right there where I think we can make the cash offer work. Do you happen by chance, Troy, to have any recent pictures you took of that property when you were there a couple months ago by chance or, or no? You can skip like two minutes, Alex, if you want. That the seller doesn't want to deal with. So we come in and we get cash wise. And the thing that's lucrative about that program is a lot of the times, I mean, of course, this one isn't moving ready for, for someone to buy anyway. This is me pitching an ovation. It's moving ready. Like when we sell a property and we team up with the seller, I market it as we offer renovations. You know, someone may request, hey, I want new kitchen cabinets. These are a little bit older. My construction team can do those at cheaper costs than what they would probably get. Um, also, too, with FHA, VA loan buyers, of course, those loans aren't going to be insured on every property. And a lot of times they come back with small little nitpick things that a seller doesn't want to deal with. So we come in and we, you know, fix those repairs. We're like a basically a concierge service, hands-off white glove experience for, for sellers where they're getting their net. They're not having to deal with real estate agents, commissions, negotiations, things like that. And we can oftentimes give them a little more money. Um, so that's why I said we do have options. It sounds like here, though, the cash option would work. But, I mean, now I'm wondering if if it was a difference of five grand, maybe, let's say if we were able to get you actually 60 instead of 55 or in that 50 range, if that's something that may even interest you if we did something like that option. I'm not sure. Well, I'm just not really sure how you're saying that you would basically need a concierge service, but you're saying that um, – you can send your team out. So you, basically you're saying that if I own another property outside of this property that I actually sell to you and you guys purchase from me based on the fact that you're going to do this plan, um, you're saying that... He was a little confused here, but I cleared up in like uh, 15 seconds. Basically, you would be my construction team in a sense um, to fix it up to whatever standard it has to be for whatever potential customer that you have that's purchasing Sorry, yeah. Yeah, so it wouldn't involve any other properties you have. It would just be this property here, 1716 Avella Road. So that property here, this one, we would essentially market it out to our buyers. We may use the, you know, the open market as well, too, and we'll offer to do renovations, repairs, and get it up to quality standard. So like you said, hey, we could probably sell it for close to 100 once it's fixed, it's fixed up. If I have to put, you know, 15, 20, whatever it is into it to get it looking pretty nice where we can get that price range, then, right. of course, I said I can get those kind of cheaper wholesale prices for my large network of contractors I work with. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of profit spread for me there. And then, of course, too, you know, I'm taking on the risk by putting the money into the property and doing the work. And then once it sells, you know, instead of, like I said, maybe instead of us giving you 55K, if we did this route, we could probably give you 5K more something like that. I have to speak with my with my boss, of course, and get approval, but um, that's another potential option. Um, yeah. I think we're really close on the cash offer, though, where that could work, but I just wanted to mention that. So, there. Alex, but, you know. yeah, if you want to pause it there, that's, that's pretty much it. Then the rest of the call is just me confirming on him getting me some pictures so I can really see what those damages look like, because he did say there was a hole in the roof that needs to be fixed and that he hasn't been the property in a few months. It's been the weather hasn't been the greatest, especially in Pennsylvania, all the snow and rain. So that does concern me a little bit <laughs> with that bathroom and the hole in the roof. Cause he said the flooring was shot in that bathroom from um, rain from the, the hole in the roof. So if it didn't get worse, then it's fine. If it got worse, then it could be a little bit of an issue. But uh, if not, I'll still just try to lock it up here um, in the next day or two. And if we don't get pictures um, and then we would just have to retrade if it's really messed up. But basically that was, that was a pretty decent call showing the whole structure because it's not every call you're going to get a seller is going to play along with the whole, the whole call and have all the time in the world. Cause I mean, that was like a 25 minute conversation where we hit everything I wanted to hit, but that's like the ideal um, kind of second closing call that you would, that you would have with a hot lead on a direct to seller scenario. Uh, I wonder if anyone has questions or, or feedback on that, or if you want to have share anything, Alex. Yeah, it would be great if someone could chime in and kind of share something they're going to take away from that because uh, I feel like listening to that call once a day is a great way to put on that closer hat and, and really like 
again, the mindset of, okay, what question should I ask? How to set up my next question? Because like Jack mentioned earlier, he's asking questions to put him in the right spot for the follow up question. If anyone doesn't have anything to share, we could also uh, do some role play or um, if anyone has just any other questions outside of this specific conversation, feel free to. And, and I'll chime in too, Alex. Like one thing I want to share is like, that's that right there, listening to that call and, and kind of breaking it down and pausing is like pretty higher level sales training. Um, like that, that was all good stuff. Like that script we use there. It's, it's from um, Eric Brewer's Eric Brewer's private mentorship group. It's a, like, it's an ovation targeted script, but the whole reason to pitch the ovation, you have to disqualify the cash and kind of go, go down the line and pivot to that. But that whole framework right there is like the best script you can use. And when I, when I did a bunch of sub two stuff and the creative stuff, I don't really follow a script structure. It's more of just like this agent doesn't know what this is. Can you talk to him or this and this and this, can you explain this to the seller? And it's like, okay. And those are a lot more like kind of just, laid back not as structured but when it comes to these even though i'm super knowledgeable with this stuff and feel really confident having conversations i still want to follow that framework um of the script and still say certain things that i said on that call and treat every call as close to possible as that one as i can because it's so important to set the stage set the framework verify the condition again um set the the anchor cash offer range, disqualify it 99% of the time, and then pivot into an ovation or, or seller finance slash creative opportunity. And really asking the seller, what's most important to you? Price, speed, convenience, you know, all that stuff. And and trying to get the the best possible outcome for both parties is what that, is, that script and structure allows for. So, um, yeah. I have a question. Sorry for the loud background noise. No worries. Um, What's up, Branson? So what are you gonna give it as a cash or an ovation? You don't know yet, or um probably novate it. I was thinking I was kind of leaning more so to the sides of cash at first, but then I was noticing that it's it's in a smaller city, um about 45 minutes outside of a major, major metro city. So with it being kind of on the outskirts more, there's probably gonna be a smaller buyer's pool of cash buyers. Um, so that's probably something where it's like, Hey, let's just throw this up on the MLS and do an ovation and more eyes will see it. And we probably won't even do anything to it. Like when you list an ovation, you just say, you know, Hey, um, renovation opportunities available. Like one guy I know who has a mentorship, he puts that in his listings just so it doesn't piss the seller off. If you're just throwing their house as is on the, on the market, you know, um, which if someone did really request renovations and you were moving towards closing, you could outsource them to a contractor and they could do that work post-closing and just add it on. Um, but a lot of times, most people are just listing novations as is on the market. Uh-oh. Jack froze. Uh, Patrice, I see. Uh, yes. Hey, was, everyone. Happy Tuesday. Happy um, Tuesday. Jack, that was an amazing call. It gave me so much insight. Uh, one thing that I wanted to point out that I really like is in the beginning of the call when you opened up and you were saying like, we are exploring houses if, if we want if we want to um, keep them or not. I think that's a very good strategy to tell a seller like, you know, we are the ones who kind of like determine what houses we want or not because it gives control, letting them know like we're not like... Um, we're not trying to just get your house. We're being strategic or very smart on what houses we want for whatever it is in the back end. Um, another question that I just wanted to ask, just to piggyback, do you um, have your options available prior to that call, being that that was a follow-up call? So that's that's one thing. When you say options in terms of like where we need to be at offers-wise and what will work. Yes. Yeah, so... We do like we'll we'll have our cash offer kind of in the notes of where we need to be at, and a lot of the times too, like you saw that call wasn't a five minute phone call, like that wasn't a quick little phone call. So, while I'm setting the stage, because that setting the stage and kind of getting more info on the motivation, the condition again, that's at least five, five to ten minutes right there before we start talking numbers. So 
what I'll do in that five to 10 minutes is I'll pull up prop stream on my other monitor and I'll be kind of, you know, comping it more in depth. Cause with the amount of leads we get, we don't have, it doesn't make sense to spend 30 minutes comping a, a property before you even have that follow-up call with the seller. Cause sometimes people say, sure, I'll sell my house. And they just say that and then they go ghost and you can't get a hold of them after calling them every single day for two weeks. So that wouldn't be efficient, but we always come up with rough valuations. So we'll get like, the major websites, PropStream, Zillow, Realtor, Redfin, and get the estimated values there. And we just kind of see those for reference. And then while we're actually on the phone with the seller, or at least this is the way I typically do it, while I'm on the phone with the seller, that's when I'll kind of actually pull up specific comps and, and look at it more in-depthly. Um, that's how I often do it. But like I said, I do this a lot and I feel pretty comfortable underwriting deals quickly and coming up with kind of creative offers quickly. So you can do it beforehand. I would only do it beforehand if it looked like a, a super hot lead that was going to be worth it. Um, because like I said, that could be a huge time killer if you're underwriting deals on kind of cold slash warm leads where you spend 30 minutes underwriting it, you call them and no answer and they ghost you. And if you're doing that a lot, it really adds up and can eat away like, you know, half of your day right there. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. Adam. Yeah, of course, of course. And then let me see here. Jason, hey, you real had... real quick. Oh, no, never mind. Go ahead, Josh. Um, Yeah, you can go next, Branson. No worries. I saw Jason had something in the chat about five minutes ago. You had a question? Oh, yeah, I do have a question. Um, I think the other guy wanted to go first, though. Oh, uh, no, it's 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 all good. It's all we'll good. We'll get we to can... both of you. Don't yeah. worry. All right, cool. Um, dang, what was my question? Oh, I, um, I don't know if you guys do uh, have any calls for this, but I'm, I've been wanting to concentrate more on like doing sub two seller finance purchases. And I think the the thing that's been stopping me is just like, you know, how do I, I guess like if I'm doing a cold call for a direct seller, even like I hire a VA and they, you know, kind of pre-qualify, you know, how do I kind of, you know, lead the conversation to that if, it, if the problem might be good for that? Yeah, that so sense. Alex and I, like, I started doing cash wholesale deals like a year and a half ago. And then when Alex and I teamed up, we were doing pretty much all sub to creative stuff for the most part. So like a lot of our Zooms previously were like, we'd still talk about cash and some other stuff, but they were mainly like 95% focused on, on sub two. So we have a lot of recordings. We've done a decent amount of sub two deals and, and happy to share that. And I know we, we have a decent amount of call recordings within our discord that you could listen to. Um, Okay. Where exactly is that, Alex? Helpful documents. Um, I know um, you have it memorized. Okay. <clears throat> Got you. Um, yeah, but I mean the whole Oh no, you're cutting out. But as far as what exactly did you have like a question about Jason as far as direct to seller creative? It's kind of yeah. hard. But go ahead. No, I'm saying like, yeah, like, how, you know, what's kind of like the strategy to you know, do that conversation, you know, especially yeah. if we do like, let's say I have, like right now I have some agents that'll send me, you know, some expired listing list, you know, let's say I, I skip trace all those and I want to start making a call, you know, how do I start the conversation? Cold. Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'll let Jack kind of handle most of it, but the most important thing is do not lead in with creative. Um, you want to disqualify cash? And the reason being is cash, as far as doing direct to seller, it's it's what most people are going to want. But if you're able to help them understand that the cash offer is not going to make sense and that either working with us to do innovation or using either seller finance, a hybrid, whatever subject to, that should be like your third or your final strategy to really see if you can make a deal with them. Yeah, and sorry, my my internet connection was showing unstable. I started to answer that for like 15 seconds and everything froze and then you were talking, Jason. <laughs> so um, let me know if it, well, I guess I'll see if it freezes. But yeah, so the conversation direct to seller is going to be not way different, but quite a bit different than direct to agent um, because obviously this house is already listed on market. But in terms of similarity, you're still going to be running through, you know, building rapport, asking about the property, trying to figure out the motivation, the condition, things like that. And then you're still going to want to use that cash offer as the anchor. So 
even with sub two deals, like I would disqualify cash. That's what you need to do, right? Because a lot of people and a lot of real estate agents, they're going to get rubbed the wrong way because so many people are calling about sub two stuff. And so many people just say, hey, will you do sub two? And then the agents just get annoyed and they don't want to deal with the seller. I mean, with the, the potential buyer immediately. But if you're at least building some rapport there, this looks like a really nice house. Like, um, tell me a bit more about it. Where have other offers been coming in at? Yeah, because if I was if I was buying this thing outright cash, you know, of course, like I said, I'm looking to buy a rental property. I can't pay full retail value for it. Um, I'm just curious if if I gave the sellers, maybe if I was coming in like at 270. I know it's listed at at uh, 310 right now. Do you think that's something that they'd entertain 270? No, no, that's way too low for them. Oh, do they have do they have a mortgage on the house by chance? I see that they they purchased the house about a year and a half ago. I'm I'm guessing they they probably don't have much equity, huh? Yeah, that's exactly it. They da, 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 da. if they sell it at this price, they're breaking even. If they drop any lower, they're writing a check. Gotcha. Well, what about if I just take over their payments? Like we do that a lot as well too. I brought I bought a couple properties last month. Um also in the Oklahoma city area where I just took over people's payments. Right. Cause I know the market's kind of shifting. A lot of these houses don't have much equity in them. I like the low interest rate loan. Um, and actually what, you know, I could actually put some money in your seller's pocket too and pay your commission. You think that's something we could make happen. So that's kind of your, your sub two pitch very briefly and crappily explained in two minutes, <laughs> but, uh, that's kind of your sub two pitch of what you do. Um, when you're speaking with agents because you want to kind of anchor and disqualify the cash and yeah. then explain how the sub two offer is the solution and how it could work. But so many people do sub two. So many agents are getting phone calls. Don't get me wrong. We could still be doing a decent amount of sub two deals if we targeted them. But when you're assigning them, there's more legal liability and headache. The assignment fees are smaller. Yeah. Um, and I think the market's shifting out of sub two deals being a prominent lead source like they were previously the last two years because you had really low interest rates you had interest rates rapidly rise you had the housing market kind of shift and take a downtrend so there wasn't a lot of equity now rates are coming down a little bit slightly we're in like the, the mid sixes the upper sixes now and the market has appreciated in the last three years from when people had these low interest rate loans so you're either getting people selling their properties at a discount sub to which wouldn't make much sense or you're going to be getting hybrid scenarios which Hybrids are kind of more rare because why wouldn't someone just price drop to get the mortgage out of their name? So mm. I think obviously people are still doing a lot of sub two deals. We did a couple um, last month in December, but it's something that we're kind of pivoting out of instead of it being like 90% of our business model like it used to be. Like Alex and I have said, maybe we want it to be like 20% of our business model now. So we still know a ton of stuff about sub two and do sub two. It's just not our main focus right now, just for like the reasons I described. Uh, okay. All right, cool. All right, I appreciate yeah. you answering my, call, uh, answering my answer, uh, question. Yeah, of course, Jason. Thanks for asking that. And then, uh, Branson, you're, uh, you're around? Yeah. Awesome. Um, I was uh, trying to ask the question in response to what you were saying earlier. Um, so, with um, just keep selling it as is on the market like that, what is... I mean, if the seller sees you doing, like, wouldn't there be a little like, what the hell? Yeah, and and that's one thing, and that's what I said. Um, oftentimes, okay. like this this mentorship I'm in, the guy says, make sure you have in the listing somewhere, um, seller is offering renovations upon request, something like that, because then if the actual seller sees the listing and they see renovations offered upon request. Then they'll say, oh, okay, so they're listing this as is and waiting for potential buyers to come in and say what they want renovated and fixed up, which we've kind of explained to them on the phone. That might be a possibility. Um, yeah, so that's your way around that of just like, hey, I didn't just take your property and throw it on the market and make a bunch of money and did nothing to it. There's a potential that could happen, but hey, it was still a hands-off experience and service for you. We still you know, probably came in and cleaned the place up a bit. Um, yeah. But that that's your way of, of handling that objection and making sure no one freaks out on you. Yeah, I think I kind of missed that because I was like just caught off guard by just selling it as is. So I was like, yeah, stuck, stuck on that thought for a second. Yeah. 
Yeah. But um, and then have you guys ever done novations where you um actually fix up the property, or so, have you guys just sold them as a? So I've only done. I haven't done a lot of novations. Like we're kind of just starting to revamp and and launch our cash cash deal. Well, our direct to seller campaign. I did a novation a while ago, but it was like. Um, it was an as is one. And I was just like an acquisitions guy on the team. I didn't do the full process from start to finish. But we have we have one novation locked up right now where we are planning on doing the work. Still not 100% sure on that because it does need a bit of work. And we are trying to get funding from potentially like a gator on that. So like we're looking for someone to fund the rehab, which would be like, basically, we got the house at like 4, 420, 427, something like that. Um, and ARV is like 550 and the house needs like 30 K of work. So we're looking for someone to give us a little bit of funds to give the seller to move out and also to cover the repairs and renovations. And then there's still a nice spread there for when we sell it. Um, but if we can't get that funding, it's been a little bit of time now where I think pretty soon we're just going to list it as is. If we can't get that funding, then we would just list it as is at like 475 still have the same verbiage there offering renovations upon request. And then, you know, maybe we'll net um, like 30 off the deal or something like that. 20 or 30. Yeah. Cool, cool. Um, Let me look through the chat here. Appreciate the feedback, Austin. Also as well, Laura. Um, the projected ARV on that house, it's about 115, 120. Um, when he, when I was speaking with the seller, I asked him, I think we skipped over that portion of the call though. I said, well, what do you think it's worth? He's like probably about 110 fixed up. And I, and I agree. It's probably like a little higher than that, but I didn't want to tell him like, Oh, 110, I think it's worth 120. Right. Cause I'm trying to obviously yeah. we're an investor <laughs> trying to make some money. So I told him, you know, yeah, it's probably, I agree. Like you're pretty spot on hundred to 110 is what I'm thinking. So in reality, ARV is closer to 120. So um, the only the, the big question mark there that has me a little scared is the repairs. Just because he hasn't been to the house in a few months, there was a small hole in the roof previously that caused enough um, leakage to cause damage to the bathroom flooring. And as we know, it's been very snowy and rainy all over the place recently. Um, so we'll see. <laughs> I hope the roof isn't completely gone now and the whole house is flooded. Then that would be a mess. But that's why you have inspection periods and refundable earnest money within the inspection period. So still a waste of time though. Like if you lock something up and haven't seen it yet, then you pay a crew to go out there and you know, you're doing paperwork and stuff like that. And you're like, Oh shoot, we did all this and the house is screwed up. But I mean, it's also the, the, the balance of, okay, let's get this locked up and start moving on it and we'll figure it out. And also the opportunity cost. But that's why I'm like, Hey, I'm going to give him one more day to try to get me pictures. If not, we're going to just lock it up and, We'll send someone out there and, and get it figured out. Um, let's see here. Appreciate the feedback. Yep. Everyone, the creative stuff is fun. <laughs> the creative stuff is fun. And there's people that are making a ton of money doing it, doing a ton of volume. And I like the creative, the sub two stuff. If you plan on keeping the deals, like, Hey, if you want to keep these deals, cool. I can get a rental property for little money out of pocket. I got a low interest rate. Yippee. Great. With the assigning of it though, now there is a little more legal liability. You assign it to a buyer who stops making payments. I've been seeing more issues of that. And uh, the assignment fees are usually small. Like, except Alex and I had one deal, one sub two deal with a 22K assignment. Um, but we did a JV on it with the guy who brought the buyer. So our net was 50% of that. But besides that, like pretty much most of our sub twos have all been under ten thousand dollars. Whereas the cash deals, like the average cash assignments, like closer to fifteen K usually. So throw innovations in the mix, you're probably going over twenty. So I'd much rather do that and have no legal liability or very minimal legal legal liability in the future than mess around with sub twos and make six, seven grand a pop on a deal. Um, you know, pay out commissions on that, overhead. The net isn't too great on sub twos. Um don't get me wrong. I'd still do them if the sub two deal fell on my lap, which a lot still do. Or if we wanted to buy one and keep it, then yeah. But just as a, a revenue perspective, targeting direct to seller, that's where all the big dogs are playing and making a lot of money doing 
direct to seller cash and novations. Awesome. Yeah, maybe we'll maybe we'll reach out to you, Jason, and and maybe present some opportunities. I know there's some people that are gators in here too, Alex. Maybe we could post a couple of our things that we're looking for for gators on in our group. Yeah, let's. Um, cool. Yeah, I was awesome. gonna say I was gonna throw too because yeah, I'm a gator, and I was wondering if you guys were for your guys with wholesale deals if you reached out to gators or if you guys do that yourselves, fund it yourselves, or what. So right now, big boss man Alex is funding um a lot of the stuff going on with Lovick. <laughs> um, ideally, it'd be nice if we had a gator for that. I mean, a lot of our stuff we were kind of funding ourselves, like you know our EMDs and stuff like that. But as you scale and do more stuff, it's like shoot, it'd be nice if we had gators to fund some of this. It'd, it'd be a lot more comfortable. Like this Lovick stuff would be a lot more comfortable if we were just like, hey, gator, you give us fifty grand, we'll pay you back, whatever, fifty seven in three months. And, you know, you're protected by these properties and you have liens on them. We're flipping two of these. We'll probably make back 60 or 50 or something like that off those two flips alone. And then all these other houses we're doing lease options on where that down payment will give us funds to help repay you, right? It's just Alex and I don't have properties with equity in them that we want that we can really leverage as collateral. And then also to um, a lot of these gators are looking for people. And don't get me wrong, like, Alex and I, we obviously know what we're talking about. We're, we're building credibility, but we don't have the 10 plus years of experience or, hey, I've done 20, 50, 30, whatever flips before. Like we've done a decent amount of wholesaling for sure, but people don't care if you're a good wholesaler when you, when you want to borrow money for flips and deals. So that's just something once we knock out this Lubbock portfolio and do some more flips and stuff like that, then that's a lot more credibility for us in terms of getting projects done and not just wholesaling. And I think it'll be easier to get funding, but I mean, if a deal makes sense and a deal is a deal and a lender sees protection within the deal, they'll do it regardless. Um, we've just been busy with so much stuff lately where we've kind of just been taking it on ourselves, but definitely I think tonight we'll, we'll post, uh, we'll post it out in the discord group here and send us, send it to some people. Um, the, the, the Lubbock portfolio at least because there is there is pretty solid protection on that because there's a couple properties that have some some quality equity that could be leaned against and uh the repayment of the loan or or the yeah the, the money that would be lent to us is pretty clear in some of these flip spreads um yeah i was yeah, i was asking for future reference because i'm a gazer but uh for business credit i have to wait to get approved because i had some you know, calories on my thing last year uh, yeah. So I was just yeah, just wondering for people right here. Yeah, no, for sure, man. Good, uh, good question. And uh, yeah, Nancy, just to mention to you, um, why we why we don't really do sub twos anymore. The market's kind of shifting. These properties that had no equity in them a few years ago now have equity in them. Um, some legal liability post closing with buyers not paying. Assignment fees being smaller than cash deals. Um, it becoming more saturated as sub two grows, you have a lot more people getting into direct to agent low equity because there's not as much of a barrier to entry to do stuff like that. So those, those are just kind of some of the factors right there. Of course, we're still doing it. You can still a great place to start and make deals happen and build relationships with agents, but just from a revenue perspective to really scale to where Alex and I want to be, we need to be doing cash stuff and doing novations and flips and, and cash wholesale assignments, not, uh, you know, five to 10k assignments on creative deals yeah but uh and then think... Porsche. uh i see you have your hand up Oop. where did you go oh hi i'm still here oh sweet oh thank you um i'm trying to now remember what exactly my question was about um but more so the initial stages just finding the properties. I see a lot of houses that are pretty distressed, but the ones that I've been targeting, they seem to already have a million people calling them or like, like by now they've maybe put up a no trespassing, how a no trespassing sign. So I'm just wondering how to better target the properties when I'm just driving around. That's a good question. Um... 
I'll let Jack kind of pop on after me, but I think some of the key is you're going to want a door knock. You're going to want to maybe send a letter, leave a note. You can try skip tracing them and giving them a call, but most likely they're going to be receiving other calls. So it's kind of like just kind of catching someone at the right time and setting yourself apart from the rest because you're not the only one. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I think you were asking, it sounds like you're doing virtual driving for dollars, Portia, is that correct? And you were asking what to look for with houses in person? No, this would be, I'm oh, driving okay. around and I'm seeing the houses in person. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, not virtual driving for dollars, in person driving <laughs> for dollars. Okay, my bad. Yeah. So, of course, all the basic generic stuff, right? You're looking for rundown houses that look like they haven't been touched in a while. What do they look vacant? There's broken windows, boarded up windows, overgrown, um, you know, shrubbery and bushes in front of the house, basic things like that. And then, you know, writing down them. And I haven't done virtual. I mean, I've done virtual driving for dollars. I haven't done in-person driving for dollars. So I don't know the most efficient tool for that, but you know, whatever it is, remembering the addresses, writing them down, or if you have some software on your phone or something, keeping track of all those addresses you see on houses that look worn down and then skip tracing them, trying to call them or while you're virtually driving or excuse me, I'm so used to saying virtual <laughs> uh, while you're driving, like Alex said, you know, leaving some sort of note or sending letters, whatever it may be, even trying to door knock them. A lot of the times though, on these houses that look super worn down, um, they're probably going to be vacant or someone could still be living there, of course, but you know, door knocking is, is definitely a possibility. But if, I mean, if you're, if you're driving around your local area and picking out these properties one by one, you have an advantage over a lot of other people because most wholesalers are going to be virtual driving for dollars or just pulling lists and cold calling them. Whereas if you can actually door knock them too and um, send mail or leave post-it notes, like you're going to have an advantage over probably 90% of your competition. That's reaching out to those homeowners. Oh, right. That's good to know. That's actually a relief because there are so many houses in different neighborhoods that I travel to. So I was just wondering how to kind of beat out the competition and how to qualify those houses, how to get in touch with the sellers. So that's been very helpful. Awesome. Great. Well, anything else from anyone here? I know we're just kind of running, running out of time here. Anyone else have any questions or comments anything like that before we we kind of wrap things up thank you everyone for yeah I, I got oh go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> yeah what's up branson um so uh like with lists are you guys gonna be able or well i know you guys have vas and all that or a couple right at least or something but um are you guys gonna give out lists to us too for like direct to sell stuff or would you be able to or no Yes, but it's kind of something that's being built out. Um, with you have to keep in mind with direct to seller, we are paying for it. So, whereas with direct to direct to agent, we are still paying for it at a much cheaper cost. So I think people that we feel like are actually going to make the calls, um, we're going to be comfortable sharing those direct to seller leads with them. Yeah. Cool. Sounds good. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Of course. And then Esther, I see you have your hand up. Yes. Um. So, uh, the director seller list. How are you going to pick those? Oh, you said, but you. I guess you sort of just. Were you requested? <laughs> you requested like through you through Discord. And when you do it, send me a message. Hey, can it be a direct to seller list, please? And I'll uh I'll make sure to get that to you as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. Now my my other question is um can you explain the novation to me? I'm not sure I understand it. <laughs> I, yes. Go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead Alex. Or do you want me to explain it's like it? an hour-long process to fully go in depth with you. I'll explain it in like a minute. 
So innovation is kind of like a net listing. So essentially what you're doing is you're almost being like the realtor for the seller. Like you're basically, you're agreeing on a net price that you're going to give the seller. And then you basically go and use the open market or the MLS and you list the property for them. So let's say a house, I think I can get 200K for. My cash offer is 120 for the seller. They're stuck at 140. I give the seller 140. I tell them the only way I can give you 140 though is if I do like a hands-off service for you where basically I'll go into the property, I'll clean it up, do a little bit of work, offer renovations and sell it to someone on the open market. So then basically anything it sells, say it sells for 200 and I offer to give the seller 140, then that's my net um, minus of course, commissions and closing costs. But it's essentially like a net listing where the seller agrees to you letting them market your market their house on the open market and you make anything on top of the price you agree upon with them. And so you don't have to you don't have to have a real estate license to do that? No, because you still have an agent. You you have a real estate agent list it for you. So like we'd have a agent or you'd use a flat fee broker who would still list the property on the MLS. You just tell the seller like, hey, you don't have to worry about negotiations, anything like that. All you're doing is just signing the closing docs. I'm taking care of all the requested repairs and renovations and dealing with all the negotiations and showings and everything. Okay. It's a cool strategy. Yeah. If you can get a, get the agent to agree with you, right? Um, and There's a lot of agents that do it. Agents won't really care because they're still making their commission. Um, Nothing's going to change with that. It's a direct to seller lead. It's not an on market lead. So basically it's just like me going to an agent and saying, Hey, I want to sell my house. They're going to so, make commission. Okay. So the seller has to, the seller has already has that agent contacted, right? No, no, that would be us bringing in an agent. Okay. So the seller has, has a house but he hasn't listed it, hasn't contacted an agent. So therefore it has to be up for sale by, by, by owner. No, it would be a, um, it would be basically just to direct to seller lead. I cold call them and I tell them my cash offer is going to be low, but I can get that offer higher. If you basically let me list your house on the open market or the MLS. So I list the house on the MLS. I offer to do repairs it's not a for sale by owner. Technically, they haven't listed it at all. They give me um, power of attorney and legal right to list it on the market and sign documents on their behalf. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's uh, we could do another. Alex and I have talked about it. Maybe ha having a Zoom just specifically focused on novations in the near future here and diving deeper into it. But that's just a quick little rundown on it. Okay, I would I would appreciate that. But thank you for that. Yeah, of course. And then uh, Anthony, last uh, last question here. How are you doing? No pressure. <laughs> hey, uh, so with the with these uh, director sellers lists, you know, I know the typical ones that you know that you kind of pull and stuff. But specifically, what are you guys pulling? Because I have batch leads, so I can go in and start pulling my own list. But I kind of want to maybe mirror, you know, so that way I can have those questions ready or whatever. I don't want to go because I tried doing uh, pre foreclosures like when I first started after like one of the bases uh, elephant challenge. And I absolutely hated it, and nobody really talked to me. So, you know, if I can go for something else, that I would have a better chance of actually getting a hold of somebody oh, uh, right. to be able to talk to them. Yeah. So, in terms of um, what list to call, that's the thing I tell people, and I think it's great. Some people are like, "Yeah, let me try direct to seller. It'll be great because it's a different experience than calling direct to agent." But if people think direct to agent sucky direct to sellers super sucky <laughs> um because direct to seller you know you're you're ideally trying to target lists that would likely have someone who's motivated like for example pre-foreclosure those people are about to lose their house so of course there's going to be motivation there to figure it out but all the other wholesalers are targeting pre-foreclosure they're getting so many dang calls they're usually in a tough spot in their life and probably like you experienced trying to call some of those you didn't have much luck um, unless you're doing it at volume with a lot of marketing and it's just really a numbers game. So that's why with direct to seller, a lot of people hire virtual assistants and VAs to do the cold calling of, okay, these people are going to call three, four, five phone numbers at once. And, you know, they're going to maybe connect with three, four, wait, maybe, you know, one to eight people a day or something, just giving <laughs> you a wide range. Um, but they're spending all day on the phone 
calling a ton of people and dealing with a bunch of no's sitting there, no answers and rude interactions to get those leads. So direct to seller stuff isn't super great unless you have a dialer and you're calling a ton of numbers at once, but sorry, that was off topic. But in terms of what we're, we're pulling list wise and what we're calling, we're kind of list stacking our partner we're working with who's pulling our, our data. So she's, she has a team of VAs that's doing a lot of virtual driving for dollars, um, which has actually been pretty decent. And then, you know, kind of tired landlord lists, um, probates, vacant liens, kind of a mix of, of a lot of different lists and criteria um, that are all kind of mixed in. So it's not one specific list we're targeting right now. We're basically list stacking a bunch of different, uh, a bunch of different lists. But um, in terms of, in terms of what works the best, lists that have that's the that's the trade-off right the more motivated the list seems the more saturation that's going to be on that list so like if you're calling pre-foreclosures that's like the hottest list that a lot of people are calling um so there's going to be more saturation on that list probably harder to get a hold of people and more pissed off sellers who don't want to talk to you um but then at the same time if you're calling other lists like say if you're just calling like a high equity list you're kind of looking for a needle in a haystack hoping that you find someone who's motivated right place right time but um, i think kind of what we're doing with the list stacking where we're doing some virtual driving for dollars looking for distressed properties and kind of mixing things up it's allowing us to kind of keen in on specific data and replicating it and targeting it but we have um one of our partners who manages our vas she's the one who's who's doing the the pulling of data and whatnot for us right now but to answer your question, we're doing a lot of list stacking with different lists of ideally motivated sellers. Hired landlords, like a super big hit for us. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing too is multiple properties. That's, that's one, right? Like tired, tired landlord situations, multiple prop. When someone has uh multiple properties, there's a higher likelihood that I've noticed getting those on terms or seller finance, Um, you know, because on PropStream, you can mess with filters where you can like click vacant, owns multiple properties. So that vacant one that this guy owns multiple properties, hey, this is probably just a spare rental they used to have and it's just sitting there vacant now and they never got around to fixing it up. Higher likelihood that you can convert that versus you just randomly calling anyone who owns a house. So um, maybe that's another thing we could do on another call too, Alex, like diving into more data pulling and scrubbing and, and lists and stuff like that maybe next week or something, but, uh, yeah. yeah, that's, that's just kind of a, a more broad answer to it. I can't tell you like, Hey, this is the best, <laughs> the best list to target. Cause there's, there's the trade-offs with everything. Like just like with us, with markets, one big city, you might have bigger spreads, but it's super saturated, smaller city. You might have a bunch of deals, but it's a smaller buyer pool and smaller spreads. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Yeah, of course. Of course. Um, all right. Well, we will wrap it up here. I appreciate everyone hanging around a little later here tonight and, uh, yeah, we'll see everyone Saturday then. All righty, everyone. Have a good rest of your night. Thanks for showing up and, uh, yeah. Awesome. Take care guys. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Hop in discord, Alex. Yeah, real quick.